Spirit, and I just ask now that we come to your word, that you would <clears throat> help us, Lord, to see into it and take away from it, Lord, the things that you have for us. And Lord, this struggle may not seem like ours, but there are times where we certainly tangle ourselves up in legalism and unnecessary religious things. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to take those off for the liberty that you earned on that cross that we just sang about. And so, Lord, we just uh, thank you in advance, and we turn this time over to you. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue now with Paul still speaking to this crowd of Jewish and Gentile believers, still making his appeal to them about them going back <clears throat> to what they left and, and just the problem with that. Let's look at the first three verses. It says, Now I say that, <clears throat> excuse me, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. But it is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So Paul starts off this chapter by giving us this picture of what would have been a wealthy household in his day. And in that picture, we see a wealthy father who intends to pass control of his wealth to the son when he reaches maturity. Now, of course, in every culture, there's a difference uh, as far as when that actually takes place, when a, when a, when a boy is, becomes a man, or what the rite of passage might have been. Um, but as long as the son, he goes on to say, is still a child, his status is like that of a slave. And that's because as a child, as most of us were, He's continually told what to do, what not to do. And in the fact that he's in a wealthy home, he has stewards who manage his property and guardians in charge of his person. And even though this in inheritance that's coming is certainly his, which will make him master of all, as Paul stated, he'll not enter into it until he's grown up. And so we could ask the question, so what purpose does this picture serve for us? Well, Paul's using it because it illustrates the condition of the Jews under the law. They were like children, being controlled by the law just like slaves. They were a slave to the law and to what was required and the penalty of not doing what was required. And we read that they were in bondage under what Paul called elements of the world. So what he was speaking of there is the elementary principles of the Jewish religion all the things that came with that religion, all the traditions, the ceremonies, the rituals. And they were designed, when you think about it, for those who did not know God the Father as he would be for them, as he has been for us, revealed in Jesus. Now when you go and you read the Old Testament, especially the law, one of the things that you see there is that it's full of shadows and pictures of spiritual things. It's looking forward to those things, but not doesn't have the substance of those things. But the thing is, it only appealed to the spiritual senses by means of the physical and the external. One of the examples of that is circumcision. Judaism was a physical, external, and temporal system. Now, that doesn't mean that there is no longer Judaism, but the system by which they had to approach the throne of God was all of those. It was physical. They had to have the sacrifices. They had to do the religious things that were required of them. It was completely external. There was no real work of the heart. It was all things that they had to do outwardly, works that would bring them this temporary relief from their condition, and that condition being sin. Remember, there had to be an annual sacrifice by the high priest to make atonement for the whole nation. And then each of those households within the nation had to do small things along the way to satisfy those requirements. And that makes it very unlike Christianity because Christianity is not physical, it is spiritual. And it's internal, it's an internal work. We're told that Jesus, we're told the Holy Spirit come to live in us. As a matter of fact, Jesus went on to say that he and his Father would come to us because of their great love for us and make their home in us. So it's a spiritual work, it's an internal work, and it's a permanent work. 
So the two are definitely contrasting. So these externals were a form of bondage to the children. Now, let's go back to one of the phrases there, elements of the world. I find it an interesting thing because if you look into the actual Greek word that Paul chose to come up with that statement in the English, that, that, that word was originally used to describe things that are in a line, so things that are lined up. But as is in ancient language, words sometimes became others, or came to different meanings. And later that word came to be known or understood as elementary knowledge. Elementary knowledge. Now, how do we kind of make sense of that? Well, we have a term that we use that would fit there. We talk about the ABCs of things. You know, the simple, the basic, the ABCs. We all grew up kind of having that phrase in our lives. So in verse 3, using that word, Paul's encouraging the Galatians to move beyond the ABCs. We might even think of that as the Scripture describes it, moving from milk to meat. Not staying with the milk of the word, but moving to the meat of the word, the fullness of it. He wanted them to move beyond the ABCs into an understanding of God's grace. And that's really important for this whole position that Paul is taking here and the mindset of the people that are in front of them. Because if they really considered God's grace at a deep level, or at least more than they already had, then their struggle to go back under the law wouldn't be there if they really considered God's grace. So he wants them to move on for what little bit they understood to what shallow understanding they had to something deeper, something more. Because the fact is, God doesn't deal with us on the basis of the ABCs. I mean, when you're first born again, yeah, he, he, he definitely takes care of us in those elementary things, in those basic things, but he wants us, I believe, to move rapidly into a maturity. Now, I'd say rapidly, but that rapidly is different for every individual. But sometimes I think people rest too long in the milk and don't seek the meat that's there, the deeper understanding, especially about grace, which I always say is a lifetime study. Because what were some of the ABCs they were dealing with? Well, one of them was just their behavior. And when they considered their behavior under the old system, they, ha- they were dealing with thoughts that they were getting what they deserved based on how good or bad their behavior was or was not. But, but what they forgot, what they had to have been taught because ta- Paul was their teacher, is that their good could not justify them under grace. Because God doesn't deal with us on the basis of what we deserve. God's blessing and favor is given for reasons that are completely in him and have nothing to do with us. And so he's trying to bring that to their attention. And as I said, because he taught them first. He's the one that led them to their faith. So I'm guessing this is not the first time they've heard this. He's reminding them. Look at verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come... God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So we have this phrase here, the fullness of the time. And that refers to the time appointed by the Heavenly Father when the heirs would become of age. We might say that Jesus came when the time was right. The father had determined that, and he sent him at that exact time. It wasn't supposed to be later nor earlier. And this shows us that the bondage under the law was a temporary condition because there was going to come a time when Jesus was sent and things were going to change. And all the prophets of the Old Testament prophesied just that. Now, it doesn't mean the law didn't serve a purpose because it did, but it was never intended to be permanent. So what about the times when Jesus came? I was, we could do a a whole night of history, but I just saw this quote from one of the commentators and I thought it was worth thinking about. Of that time, it says, it was the time when the Pax Romana extended over most of the civilized earth and when travel and commerce were therefore possible in a way that had formerly been impossible. Great roads linked the empire of the Caesars 
and its diverse regions were linked far more significantly by the all-pervasive language of the Greeks. Add the fact that the world was sunk in a moral abyss so low that even the pagan cried out against it, and that spiritual hunger was everywhere evident. A perfect time for the coming of Christ and for the early expansion of the Christian gospel. And not only was it a perfect time, but it was a planned time. You know, there's that period between the New Testament and the Old Testament, the intertestamental period, they call it. 400 years go unrecorded, at least biblic in the Bible, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we can't ignore that time. And a matter of fact, that little bit of history there is the picture of why I believe God waited those 400 years to continue on. Because two very significant, if you're paying attention, things happened during that 400 years. The Romans built the roads. Why was that so important? Because the gospel had to go, and there had to be a way to travel. And so the roads were built, and the language on the, across the known, known world was all one language. Everyone spoke Greek wherever you went. And so God was building that during that time, not, wasn't absent, wasn't wasting time, so that when Jesus came on the scene, all those things would be in place to make the going of the gospel, the Great Commission, possible. Not only that about the timing, but you go back, and we won't do it tonight because we don't have time. You study the prophecies in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament as far as the, 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 the yeah, weeks of years, the, and, and this was the time period. It was closing. That had to happen for the next period to come. And um, if you're not familiar with the book of Daniel, I would just say spend some time in it because it's, it's just one of the most amazing books in the Bible, and it laid out everything about the coming Messiah, which, why, which is why in most cases today a, uh, a rabbi will skip over the book of Daniel. They won't teach from the book of Daniel. Because if you teach from the book of Daniel, you have a problem. Because if you teach from the book of Daniel, the Messiah has already come. And they can't figure that out. Because if you work the math in the book of Daniel, and the fact that he was going to be cut off before the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD, there's a problem. He's already come. He's already come. Praise God. So in this verse, we also have an amazing statement regarding the deity and the humanity of our Savior. He is the eternal Son of God, yet he was born of a woman. If Jesus had been just a man, a mere man, it would be unnecessary to say that he was born of a woman, because how else does a mere man be born? But the expression is a witness to his unique person and the unique mode of his birth. You know, Jesus was born into the world as an Israelite. That means, therefore, he was born under the law. As a son of God, Jesus would never have been under the law, but because he was born to a human woman, he had that experience. And it's interesting because as God, he was the one who gave the law. But in a condescending grace, he put himself under the law that he made. And he did so in order that he might magnify it in his life and bear its curse in his death. Because the law demanded a price for those who failed to keep it, and that price was death. Before God could bring men into the position of sonship, this price had to be paid. So Jesus coming into the world as a member of the human race and of the Jewish nation paid the price which the law demanded. His death was infinite in value because he is God. His death was sufficient to pay for any number of sinners. And he would be a substitute for man because he was man. Now, as long as men were slaves, they could not be sons. It's a very important distinction, and they would have understood that in their culture for certain. But Jesus delivered them from the bondage of the law in order that they might be adopted as sons. Now, it's interesting is those days, especially in the Roman culture, an adopted son almost had more rights than the natural son. There was a very high esteem. It wasn't just they were taking someone else's child into their home. They had all the rights. They were very important. It wasn't a second-class membership to a family. 
And so we need to keep that at a, before us when we think about how Paul is describing our relationship as sons, as adopted sons and daughters, excuse me. But notice here the distinction between becoming a child of God and a son of God. Because a believer is born into the family of God as a child. We read that in John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. But the emphasis here is on the fact of divine birth, not on the privileges and responsibilities of sonship. The believer is adopted into the family as a son or daughter. Every Christian son or daughter immediately, I mean, as soon as you're born again, you're a son or daughter immediately, and you're brought into the inheritance, and you're an heir to that inheritance. It's an amazing thing. And you think, well, you know, what is that inheritance? You know, is it that big? You know, am I getting a down payment now and I get the rest later? Well, Paul answered that. Listen to Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 14. It says, For as many as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So we're joint heirs with Christ. God sent his only begotten son. And you think of everything Jesus did as the son of God and what he inherited when his work was done. And it says that we are heirs with him as sons. That's pretty amazing. We're not equal to him by any means, but yet we share as sons with him. Another important thing is the adoption is something we receive. It's not something that's been recovered. That's an important distinction because by faith and because of God's grace, we receive something greater than what Adam even had. That's an amazing thing. We're not getting something restored that Adam lost. This is something that Adam didn't even have. Look at verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So in order that those who are sons of God might realize that their their position, God sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to indwell them. And the Spirit causes an awareness of sonship, causing the saint to address God as Father. And in particular here it says, Abba, Father. And it's interesting because those two words combine the Aramaic and the Greek words for the Father in the home. And we understand it in our English as the word Daddy. And some people are uncomfortable with that. And other people have actually fought against it. That's too intimate. That, That shouldn't be the way we're able to speak to God, to call him daddy. And yet we were just told that we were sons. We were saved from hell and death by faith and grace. And so there's an intimacy there that we're to enjoy, to seek out, and to believe in. And so it may be uncomfortable, but in the Greek somewhere it says get over it, I think. Now what's interesting is a slave could never address the head of a family in that way. It was a title reserved for members of the family and expresses love and confidence. So believers are no longer slaves. They're not under the law. They're now sons of God. And they have Abba, Father, Daddy in heaven. Since Jesus is God's son, is the heir of all God's riches, the Christian is an heir of God through Christ. And all that God has is the Christians by faith. And so, again, how much is that? Well, again, in Ephesians, Paul answers that. He says, verse 3 of chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, listen, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And it doesn't say later on. It doesn't give us a future date for that to take place. 
No, those of us that are saved have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's an amazing thing. Now, I've read, and I've read it a couple times in a couple different places, that in the rabbinical schools in Israel where they're training to be rabbis, a student is not allowed to read either the Song of Solomon or Ezekiel chapter 1 until he's 40 years of age. Now, the Song of Solomon is considered too sexually explicit for a younger mind, under 40. And Ezekiel 1 contains a description of the glory of the indescribable and inexpressible God. Now, in the Talmud, which is the rabbinical writings of the Jews, it tells a story in there of a certain person that was under 40, and he began to read Ezekiel 1. And the story says that fire came out of the page and consumed him. So to them, that meant a man under the law is not considered a man until he is 40. That was their reasoning. Now, I don't know the truth of that story. I have no video. But, um, but it's interesting how many things that they associated to tr- prove maturity and that they would put an age on it. So up to the age of 40, the Orthodox man is considered a minor. I found that interesting because a Jewish child, when they're 13, they go through a bar mitzvah. And I remember being taught that's when that's the rite of passage, you become a man. And actually it's not. They just become a son of the covenant. And in this rabbinical thinking, they're yet to be that adopted son because they're not fully mature yet if you were to look at the writings of the Talmud. I'm just sharing this because I thought it was interesting. And plus, it's important because that's not the case with believers under grace. The moment we're saved, the whole inheritance is ours. We're treated as an adult, mature sons and daughters, and we have the whole Bible to read, enjoy, and obey. We're not kept from any of it. We don't have to wait to a certain age. What I want to do is I just want to read now from verse 8 through verse 20, and we'll talk a little bit about it. We're not going to tear into it line by line. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be jealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in good, in good things always, and not only when I am present with you, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. So he's saying to them, when they didn't know God, they worshiped idols. And he says, now you you know God, and God knows you. And yet you're picking up the same habit again with going back into all of the things of the past. Maybe not actual idol worship, but making idols of the things that they're trying to follow. Making idols of the law. Making idol of all the rituals of their religion. And making those the qualifiers of themselves before the Lord. 
And in particular, he talks about the days and the months and seasons and the years. They were following their calendar, but they were following in such a way that they were giving too much credence to the, the high, to the days and worshiping them and the heavenly things instead of just purely worshiping God. And Paul admits he's, he's afraid for them, and he's wondering, did I labor for, to, for you in vain? Have you forgotten what I've taught you? Do you forget what you have learned? And then he goes into this fact that he had a physical infirmity at that time. I've read some pretty good understandings of the location that he was in, the places he was at prior, and, and there's a good chance that maybe he picked up malaria along the way, and he was sick with malaria at this time. We don't know for sure. But he says, you know, I've become everything for you guys. Become like me. And in that, he's saying, I've been where you've been. I grew up in Israel, Israeli. I grew up under the law. I did everything to follow it. But now be like me, learning what the liberty is and not returning to the law, not returning to that bondage. And then he warns them about those that have been teaching them wrongly, those that are trying to steal them away, and with that, steal their liberty. And that's the Judaizers, the ones that are telling them that they have to follow the law. And of course, accounted with them are the ones that turn their back on their own testimony, like Peter, who who's separated himself from them when other Jews were watching suddenly. But there in verse 17, he says, they zealously court you, but for no good, yes, they want to exclude you, what? Exclude you from the liberty that you may be zealous for them. In other words, they want you to follow them. They're, all they're trying to do is get you to be their followers to worship them. And so he's warning them off of that. And then he tells them, that, as he closes there, that he'd like to be with them. And he loved to change the tone of what he's saying, but he's afraid. He's got doubts that they're going to do the right thing. So I'm going to pause there. I wanted to go further, but it would take us too far for a night like this. So a little bit short, but. So I know it seems a lot of repetitiveness chapter by chapter, but we see that he's finding different ways to explain the same point. And I'm guessing he's not getting the response from his audience that he's wanting because he keeps going and he keeps teaching. And so we'll go along for the ride and hopefully learn and just, if nothing else, celebrate our liberty and make us cautious of trying to return to religious things that would bind us again. Questions or thoughts?